2,000 years ago, an event took place that changed the destiny of anyone who would call upon the name of the Lord. Some of us here today are numbered in that group. We have responded to the call of God on our lives. We've repented of our sins. We've trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior. We've surrendered ourselves to Him as our Lord, and we have been saved. And today we remember what Jesus did for us by participating in the Lord's table. But there may be some here today, and there probably are, who have yet to repent of sin and trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And if that pertains to you, we're glad that you're here because we want you to see what this table means. We only ask that when the elements are passed, you just refrain from taking those because the elements are meant for those who have already trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, who are saved and have followed through in that salvation with baptism, just as Wesley did this morning. You do not have to be a member of this church to partake of the table, but you do need to be a born-again, baptized believer. And so, if that describes you, we welcome you to participate in the table today. But if you're struggling with faith, if you're questioning, if, if, if you just haven't made that final step, then my prayer has been that today will be the day of salvation for you. And that as you hear the gospel story recounted, as you see the elements and what they symbolize, that you will surrender your life to Christ and that you will come to be a believer in Him. In much of the music today, you've seen already, we're focusing on the cross. And sometimes the cross is referred to as the tree. Uh, trees figure prominently in Scripture, especially in God's relation to mankind. Some of you may be familiar with the children's book, A Tale of Three Trees. It's based on an American folktale, and it begins, Once upon a mountaintop, their three little trees stood and dreamed of what they wanted to become when they grew up. And, and they dreamed about other things, but what ended up happening was one became the cradle of the Lord, one became a boat for the Lord, and one became the cross of the Lord. It's a, it's a wonderful little American folktale. But there were far more than three trees in the Bible. You see, God created Adam and Eve from the dust of the earth and Eve from the rib of Adam. And after God created man and woman, God had his first fellowship with man under the boughs of the trees in the perfect garden of Eden. Can you imagine the wonderful relationship that man and God enjoyed there with no sin, no separation, no sadness, no death, no worries, no stress. Life was perfect under those trees. But there was one tree in the garden from which God had told Adam and Eve to never eat, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But on one otherwise perfect day, Satan in the form of a serpent tempted Adam and Eve to eat from that tree. And he did what he would do for millennia to come and still does today to humans when he tempts them to sin. He appealed to the lust of their eyes the cravings of their flesh, and the pride of their heart. He dangled rebellion against God and, and disobedience to God like a gold prize to be won. And on that day, Adam and Eve stumbled over that tree in the garden. They ate and sin entered the world. And from that moment on, the perfect world was tainted, and, and man's struggle with sin and its consequences began. So you see, sin even began under a tree. After several generations, sin had become so rampant in the world that God decided to start over creation. He selected one righteous man's family with whom to start over, and that man's name was Noah. 
God called Noah to build an ark, a giant boat, even though it had never rained and no one had ever seen a flood. Noah cut down many trees to build that great ark of wood, and God started over with some trees. Hundreds of years later, when God's people found themselves enslaved in Egypt, God appeared to Moses from a burning bush, a small tree, and he called Moses to go to Pharaoh and to tell him to let my people go and to lead the people out of bondage in Egypt. And so Moses, with the guidance and help of God, did just that. However, while they were on their way to the promised land, the people came in danger of snakes, and many were being bitten and, and even threatening to die. And Moses shaped a pole from a tree and attached a bronze serpent to it. And anyone who was bitten by a snake with that deadly poison could look to that tree and be healed. And so men, women, boys, and girls were healed by looking to a tree. As God taught his people how to worship him, he called them to build a tabernacle. The wilderness tabernacle with its poles, its table of showbread, its sacrificial altar, its mercy seat, its Ark of the Covenant and more, were crafted from wood and overlaid with gold. They were God's instruments through which he taught his chosen people. Some generations later, Solomon would build a magnificent permanent temple out of the cedars of Lebanon. So there, with a a structure and furnishings made of trees and covered with gold, mankind learned to worship God and to offer sacrifices for their sins. Worship was assisted by trees. In the fullness of time, God sent His only begotten Son into the world, born of a virgin, to take away the sins of the world. And Jesus loved trees. They gave Him a manger in which to be born, a a trade for the use of His hands, and a boat for a pulpit and a bed. Trees took Jesus over the water to his preaching missions. They uh, provided the soft shade for his weary body. They even allowed him to quench his famished lips from their fruit when he was faint. (laughs) They even provided a place for a short little man to see Jesus. Jesus changed Zacchaeus' life that day. All because of a tree. Branches of palms added the only dignity to Jesus' entry to Jerusalem as the people cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they waved those palm branches. Celebration happened under the branches of trees. But that celebration would be short-lived as people's hearts grew hardened. In Gethsemane, the ancient olive trees were sleepless sentinels who kept silent watch while the disciples slumbered. Hours later, under those same trees, a friend betrayed Jesus with a kiss, and he was turned over to those who wanted him dead. Hands of scorn laid sharp steel to the roots of a forest monarch and crafted it into a shameful cross. And fingers of hate tore thorn branches from a tree and twisted them into a mocking crown for his brow. They placed sharp spikes into his hands and his feet. And there they crucified Jesus. There On the cross, Jesus took the sins of the world to a tree. It was there at the cross where everything changed.
We now have to back up in the story a bit to pause and to reflect. On the night before Jesus died, before he was arrested, before he prayed in Gethsemane, Jesus knew that it would be on a tree that his body would be broken and that his blood would be shed. And so it was for that reason that when he gathered with his disciples in the upper room, he took bread. And he looked at that bread and he knew what was soon to happen. He knew he would go to the cross. He knew his body would be bruised. He knew his body would be pierced. He knew his body would be broken. And so as Jesus was there contemplating the most common of elements on that table, he realized it would be a great symbol for the most uncommon of acts that he was about to do. And so as Jesus took that bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At that moment, they had nothing to remember, but they would soon realize what all this meant. Today, we gather and we remember, for we know what Jesus did. And so as you receive this bread and the cup in just a moment, just hold them there and reflect upon the bread for a moment. And after we have a time of worship, we will eat the bread. Then I will explain and talk about the cup for a moment. We'll reflect upon it, and then we will drink that together. But before we distribute the elements, Mike, would you please lead us in prayer of thanksgiving for this bread? Let's pray. Our Father, it's with humble hearts that we come before you this day kneeling truly at the foot of the cross to remember the sacrifice that you made. As you called us to remember that sacrifice when you broke the bread, we come before you, Father, to thank you, to praise you for doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. And so as we participate, as we remember, we come with hearts filled with gratitude. For Lord, we know that it's through your sacrifice on Calvary's cross that we have a right relationship with you and with the Father. And for this, we are thankful and we are grateful. For it's in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. On that night, Jesus said, Take, eat, this do in remembrance of me. Not only would Jesus' body be pierced and broken on that tree. But in addition, Christ's blood would be shed on that tree. The story is told that an Italian artist named Franchetti never would complete a painting of Christ on the cross because he never could. Every time he tried to, to paint that scene, he wept so hard that he couldn't put his brush onto the canvas. He was so overcome with remembrance of what happened on the cross. So as you received the cup and as you look now into its dark crimson color, it reminds us of what Jesus did for you. As his blood was shed for you and for me. Paul wrote in Colossians 1, 19 through 22, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. 
But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Jesus said, this is the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. You see, the story didn't end on the cross. He is alive. And he's coming back. And that's why on the cross, when Jesus made his last statement, it is finished, we call that a statement of freedom. A statement of victory. Because on the cross, the payment for your sin and for my sin was made once and for all. And there, we were set free. Paul also wrote in Colossians 2, 13 through 15, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So whereas sin began at a tree, Sin was ultimately conquered at a tree. And whereas God started over with an ark built by a, for, well, a lot of trees in Noah's day, we all can start over by coming to this one tree. And whereas men, women, boys, and girls were healed by looking at a tree in the wilderness to be healed from the poisonous bite of serpents, so we too can be healed today from the poisonous bite of sin by looking to this one tree. So whereas life was perfected, perfect under the trees of the Garden of Eden with no separation between God and man, by coming to the cross... And bowing before our Lord Jesus Christ beneath it, we can be reconciled to God and we can be separated no longer. And now, once we've done that, we can look forward to the promise of the perfection in heaven. Because you see, there's, there'll be trees there as well. For John on the Isle of Patmos received a, a vision from the Lord. We call it the revelation and in it he said that in the midst of the street of the city of God uh, and on either side of the river there was the tree of life that we might live forever in perfection. For remember, that's why God cast Adam and Eve out of the garden. They had eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They did not need to then eat of the tree of life and live in that state forever. God removed them from the garden, but the tree of life is in heaven. Paradise lost. Paradise regained. All because of the tree of life, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the mercy tree. You know, the cross is the centerpiece of Christianity. In fact, we get some important words from the cross. Crucial. The word crucial is derived from the Latin meaning pertaining to the cross. The word crux, when we say the crux of the matter, that is the word for cross in Latin. So whenever we say this issue is crucial or this is the crux of the matter, what we are saying is just as important as the cross is to Christianity, this statement or this point is to my argument. It's the crux. It's the crucial part. And so the question this morning is, is the cross crucial to your life? Is it the crux of your life? You know, your life should be made completely different when the cross is center in your life. It changes the way that you relate to God because it reconciles you to God. 
It changes the way you rec- relate to other people because it reconciles you with other people. It, it changes the way you look at the world because you realize the need that everyone has to come to the cross. And when that's the case, you are amazed by the old rugged cross. Uh, many of you followed me and my oldest son, Zach, this week. We had a father-son trip to Washington, D.C. It was this is the third time we've tried to do it. We finally got to pull it off, and uh, we had a great time. We got there Monday and left Friday and cried, tried to cram everything in. And if you've ever been to D.C., you know you can never see everything no matter how many days you have because one thing is your legs and feet just won't take it. But one thing that I'm always struck with at D- in D.C., and I-, I went several times in high school and college, and this was my first time to go in many, many years to really get to see things. And, you know, you're all, I'm always amazed that the White House is bigger than I expect it to be. Mount Vernon is smaller than I expect it to be. The Washington Monument soars up into the sky. The, the changing of the guard at Arlington Cemetery is always breathtaking. In fact, Zach said, we could just stay here forever and watch this. It was just it's so moving and peaceful and calm there. And we went into the, the Capitol Dome, and I learned something there this trip that I, I didn't know before, but that the dome is actually cast iron, and it weighs 9 million pounds. That's 4,700 tons. And if you stand in the Capitol and you look up, you, you're, you're seeing only really part of the dome. You can take the entire Statue of Liberty and put it in the dome and still have 30 feet to go to the top. That's awe-inspiring. It's amazing. But you know what's more amazing? The cross of Jesus Christ. Because that dome in Washington, D.C., on our Capitol building, stands as a symbol of our nation, a nation that's only a couple of hundred plus years old. But this stands for God's work that began before the foundation of the world and continues to this day. The cross is the crux of the matter. It is crucial to our life. And so today, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we want to give you an opportunity to do that because you've heard the entire gospel from beginning to end. And I don't see how anybody could hear what God has done through Jesus Christ and not realize their need for it. Because you see, we're all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. There's no faking it. There's nothing getting around it. We are. We all know we are. And so we try different ways to deal with our sins. Some people try to earn their way to heaven by doing good or going to church or giving money. But the the thing is, the Bible tells us that our good works are as filthy rags. The dirtiest of rags. And so no matter how much good we do, it's just like a pile of dirty laundry piled on top of our sins. And that's not going to work in heaven where perfection is required. And so God made a way through the cross for the blood of Jesus to cover our sins. And when that blood covers our sins, they are forgiven and they're forgotten. And the way that you can receive that covering is by coming in faith to Jesus Christ and saying, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins. I turn from them and I turn to you Would you be my Savior? And when you come to the Lord like that, He does save you. You're born again, we say. You begin your life anew. And then once that's happened, you you have to take that next step, which is not just having a Savior, but surrendering your life to Him as your Lord. Because if He died on the cross for your sins, then don't you think it's only right that you give your life to him, especially when he says, I came to give you life and that more abundantly. And that he has a purpose and a plan, a plan to prosper you and not to harm you, a plan to give you a future and a hope. So we don't have to wander aimlessly in life wondering what we're supposed to do. We can just trust God and he gives us that purpose. And so this morning we want to give you an opportunity to trust Jesus 
as your Lord and Savior. And you can just right where you are, if you've never done this, just pray and say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that you died on the cross for my sins. I need you to come in and save me. Become my Savior. And Lord, I surrender my life to you. Be my master. Take the will. Take over my life. I give my life to you. I hope that you've never, if you've never done that before today, you did that right now. And that from this moment forward, you're saved. And we, I hope that in a few moments when we have our time of response that you'll come, you'll let me know of your decisions, so that we can share that with the congregation and we can celebrate what you've done. We celebrate all kind of stuff. We celebrate awards. We celebrate ball victories. The biggest thing you can celebrate is somebody coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's a big deal and it's important. And we want to cheer you on. There may be another decision that the Lord's laid upon your life. Maybe you've been struggling with a call to uh, vocational ministry or missions and, and the Lord's been placing that call. This is a time to say, I surrender to that call because of what Jesus did for me and because I want to let others know what he did for them as well. It may be that the Lord also is calling you to be a part of this church. God's doing great things here. We want to see God continue to do that. Perhaps he's calling you to be a part of that. And so we invite you to come.